Brad's back again. It's been a while. It's been a whole, almost a whole pandemic. I mean, that's, I feel like I'm trying to catch up with all my guests and see how the year's been. It seems like everyone's had some big changes besides, you know, maybe now returning back to work. What's been in the books for you there, Brad? Um, yeah, so COVID was pretty wild. Like we got sent home from school in March and then I talked to you that summer, right? Last summer. Yeah. Um, then we went back and I was in person most of the school year working with kids um, in the classroom with social distancing, with masks on and going to um, going remote over the holidays was pretty wild. So so the whole teaching thing got turned upside down is what I'm saying, I guess. Yeah. One of the biggest things I didn't even think of was a uh, teacher that was on here brought up to me was the fact that like kids need school because a lot of them, that's their meal. Like when they get a free meal and things of that sort. And I was like, I never even thought about that. I thought in the beginning, at least the kids would have been loving learning online and the whole dynamic shift from, you know, kids not paying attention, you know, kids just uh, keeping their thing on mute or keeping their thing off made it very difficult for teachers. It was a very stressful time, especially for teachers and essential workers at the times too. people that still had to go to their job. It's been a weird learning experience. It's got to be freaky to be back in the room. Uh, it was a little weird at first, but um, we got used to it. The kids' desks were all six feet apart and we had to make that work the best we could. And, and it was all good in the end. Um, we had more come back after the holiday break and that sort of thing and it was nice to see those faces come back in the classroom and and a lot of studies are showing that the school environment was one of the safest to be in this whole time because of all those measures that had to be taken um you know kids had to be masked if they were going to be there and so there was a lot less sickness and flu and that sort of stuff um, as well as less covid yeah, it just it was so strange because you can kind of see both sides with people that want the mask and people that don't like people still want to see their kids faces at times feel like they need to see because kids are very reactive to yeah. things that they see and stuff like that. It's just been a whole weird shift, man. It's like and then kind of going back to it now where it's like I'm, my little nephew's like in elementary school. Like the hardest thing I see is just trying to when you get the temperature check everybody when they're going in, at least uh, when they open back up is temperature checking the whole line. I was like, you got to show up an hour and a half early just to make sure they can get every single because that's a long line of people. They got to check every individual car, make sure you're OK. And I'm like, man, what's up? I guess the good part is I've heard good and bad things about museums coming back. A lot of people were very excited to go back into them. And then there's also a lot of issues going on because people started looking up, I guess, during the whole time they were in the pandemic lockdown, they started researching. And now everyone hates the UK museum, which I don't understand why. But I mean, I get it, I guess, because they own a lot of stuff that's not technically theirs. But right. Yeah. Yeah, there are some efforts with the museum world to kind of um, get things back in the hands of the people whose culture it came from. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of something that needs to be addressed in some way. And some of those museums are open and saying, yes, we'd like that back for these historic reasons and others are not as aggressive in pursuing it or understand the way it was collected, it tells a story that's important and they don't want to remove that from the place where it is now. Well, that was our what fear when we were talking about it on the first episode was how many people don't go to a museum anymore. Then luckily, I think a lot of people made plans to go do these types of things when they were open back up. I mean, even if they didn't want to necessarily go to a museum, they went to an aquarium. They went to all these businesses that people really haven't gone a whole lot to just because you can get a lot of this information online. I mean, everything's kind of archived online in some type of digital form. But like we talked about on the first time we chatted, you know, being there in person, the experience of everything is something that is really unbeatable. You can't really match, you know, it, it, much as you can get through a Zoom call, much like teaching or learning through Zoom. It's not the exact same as doing something if you're going to the actual place and learning it from the actual place it's coming from. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, I think, an added bonus to get to see those artifacts. Um, sometimes they're touchable things that, you know, you might not touch the pen that Benjamin Franklin used or whatever, but something similar to it to get the feel. And that kind of thing is important, especially for kids who need that kind of immersion into whatever it is that they're uh, learning. 
Like they need to be surrounded by it sometimes to really get it where they can't just read a panel like we would and understand. Um, so museums provide that a lot better when you can go there. <laughs> yeah, especially like uh, what I like to do, like, I, do you have anything in your book, I would say, that would be something that keeps you grounded or keeps you a little bit more like, I don't know, aspiring to more? Because like what I like to do is if I get a too big of an ego, I like to look up videos of like people doing it. Like people are great. It's like they always have one every single year as a YouTube compilation of oh, just a bunch of people doing amazing things with sports that just make me feel like a sack of crap. So I like watching those because it keeps me grounded. But I, man, there's some crazy things when it comes to the amount of abilities that someone has and like a certain talent or a gift where I'm like, man, if I could do that, I could be in the Olympics or uh, just for instance, uh, there's a Dodgers baseball player. I don't know if you've seen this video circling around. He got hit in the face with a 90 something mile an hour fastball and just knocked his sunglasses completely off. Now I'm not interested in the fact that he got hit in the face. What I'm interested in is seeing the crowd's reaction because these are a bunch of people that are now coming into a stadium. Now that it's opened, being able to sit side by side, being able to sit in a actual and experience the game rather than through their TV when our sports was down for so long. And then you get to see all these people's right. reaction of when the guy gets hit in the face with the ball falls to the ground and then everyone just go <gasps> and just jump out of their seat like in shock and really even people that were wearing the opposite team's jersey that were worried and i'm like that's what that restores my faith yeah. in humanity a little bit yeah honestly yeah baseball is typically what i go to when i need a humble moment because it, baseball is a game of failure and <laughs> that's where the big moments get everyone so excited because most of the game, and I get why a lot of people think it's boring, you know, guys striking out, hit a grounder to second, pop fly to left, like not a lot going on in general. But then those moments where all of a sudden there's that hush, like somebody gets hit, somebody drives one out of the park um, and the crowd explodes or gets really quiet. Um, those are those intense moments I live for in that game. But most of it is really humbling and trying to adjust to failure to do the best that they can the next time. It's also like the gamble of the game, too. I mean, as much as what's come out with CET and all this type of stuff that's happening with all these football players where they're like showing that their mental brain capacity is kind of degraded, like they might be 30 years old, but they have the brain of like a 90 year old. I'm like the gambling yeah. risk of doing the sport, you know, there's. And especially doing, is there anything that you love so much to do that you know that there's a price to it when it comes to like just your sanity or your physical abilities? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if teaching degraded my body to the point where I couldn't live a functional life by the time I'm 40, I don't think I'd be doing it. <laughs> it degrades your patience, I think. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Um, but you got to use those moments to help build it back up. That's that's the way I try to think of it. Yeah, with um, I know especially because I think we were talking a little bit about the YouTube channel that you were doing before. Um, so did that end up switching off? Yeah, yeah. So last summer I had kind of hard times getting into museums to to make videos because the whole point of the channel was to promote museums. Um, so I started a blog and writing about museums and the struggle they're having and just my thoughts about things while I was sitting there out of work, um, not really knowing what to do with myself. And then the whole um, creative end of it just kind of fell apart. Um, there were some personal issues and it all just kind of tumbled down. So- Well, do you um, enjoy the blog more? The blog was great. I felt a lot of, a different kind of freedom of expression um, with that. And just being able to kind of sit down and whenever I have a thought, chase it and get it out. And um, so that was a really good feeling. Well, I mean, I think uh, the important part you got to look at this is that even if your blog has one viewer, two viewers, you're still, no, I'm not saying that yours is, I'm just saying as an example, like you could have hundreds or thousands. It doesn't really matter about the size of the impact, but you're affecting someone that's reading that. I think that's like the main importance of like people that are doing podcasts. Like I'm pro anybody starting a podcast, even though people say there's way too many out there. There's definitely is, but at the same time, it's such therapy. And especially if somebody can pull something from that, you don't know if the one blog post you put up about, I don't know, some 
something that you found fascinating, whether you're like practicing with the rainbow light or you're doing something that shows a refraction of something. I saw a couple of your blog yeah. posts and I saw like the, <laughs> yeah, but I was saying even something like that, that's something that where you read it, it's impactful. However you want to lay it. I mean, that's what you kind of have to put into it too, because someone like me or someone else out there is going through something might be able to read it and then be able to pull something from it. I mean, that's the main thing that I really try and promote with conversation is that's the community aspect of everything. We're not really talking a whole lot when it comes to like helping each other in ways. It's more of like, it seems like a competition when it's come to be successful, when it comes to the industry, when it comes to all these things. And that's something like kids, they don't want, they shouldn't learn that type of stuff. And people are like, well, you should brace them for what the world's going to be like. Yeah. But I'm like, we can stop that by teaching better than that. Right. Yeah. And the, the best way to teach little kids, um, you know, how to not be like obnoxious YouTubers or whatever it is we're, we're trying to guide them away from is to do our best to model it, you know, as an adult, just like show, instead of lecturing them about how to be, show them how you like to be for yourself. And then they can see that and like, oh, wow, you know, that really irritating thing happened and Mr. Brown just kind of blew it off. Um, so instead of getting all crazy and yelling at the class or whatever, um, so yeah, really take stock in, um, modeling behaviors and that community aspect that you brought up is something that's really struck me since I started working in the schools. Like that's what schools are all about, building the community and the trust in the classroom and, you know, getting through it together. It's not about like focusing on individuals and Billy needs to be at this reading level by, you know, the end of May or whatever. Those things are important, but you really want to build a community so that Billy knows how to ask for help when he needs help instead of feeling like he can't trust anyone. Yeah. The openness to it too. I mean, those are fundamental skills that need to be taught early because if we notice so how many times throughout society we notice people that don't have those fundamental skills of it's it's really all a more of a selfish type of game which i get if you have your own goals on the prospects it's good to make sure that you're only thinking about yourself you got to make or grind or do whatever you have to do to make sure that you have your goals completed before anything else but i'm like doesn't one sinking ship or one rising uh boat raise all tides or something of that sort, some type of thing that goes with along those lines. But when one person works together, you know, everyone can work together and you see a way better outcome when it comes to the effect of just an overall community aspect of things. I mean, it's not a really terrible world to live in. And I don't, I know that's what a lot of the news and everything projects and especially kids nowadays, there's kids at 12, 11 years old that back when I was that age, I was worrying about like when cartoons were going to be on, I have to wait till Saturday or I'm not going to get a chocolate milk or something at lunch. And then now it's kind of like, right. Oh, you got to worry about a pipeline exploding into the ocean. And the kid sees that on his phone. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, I want you to have the phone. That's the whole point is that you can communicate. You can have this new knowledge source at your fingertips, but I also don't want you learning that the government does terrible things. Yeah, that kind of uh, more adult news type information is getting in the hands of kids a lot more readily. Like back when I was a kid, like my dad would watch Face the Nation on Sundays. And I still do. I love that show. But as a kid, I was just kind of like, I think it's time to go outside now. <laughs> um, and it, maybe it would have been good for me to sit and try to absorb like what was happening. But it, it just wasn't like impressed upon me at a young age. Like I see a lot of people doing now. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out like 10, 20 years with this generation that's in elementary school right now will will come up doing and thinking about the world i think it's interesting because as much as i say i might have a problem with the educational system i noticed it's gotten a lot better from when i was in uh, at least when i was in school when i was in school they didn't really know what adhd was like when i was in elementary school so it was just easier to put me in a room right. And then just kind of put a notebook in front of me and tell me, here's just draw or do whatever until school's over with. I mean, one time they forgot to give me lunch and they were like, you know, they'd come in, they'd sit next to you and they'd be like, hey, um, 
or sorry, we didn't give you lunch, but here's this. And they wanted to make sure I wasn't going to tell my parents because I was that I was a young kid. So they didn't want me to tell my parents what happened. Like they, I missed lunch or something. So they gave me a snack at the end, yeah. talked to me for 10, 15 minutes, and then let me finally go. I totally spaced okay. out about it. I'm a kid already worrying about other things. Um, but the education system now there's meditation classes that people are doing instead of recess sometimes to help a kid calm down. I mean, more one-on-one, especially nowadays with classrooms needing Mm -hmm. six feet. Now kids are a little bit smaller to a class, which makes it a bigger workload on teachers, but it also gives some more individual timing as well too, which I think is prime importance. But I think the main curve that's going to be the new age of education in a way is kind of like video games with the whole aspect. I know we talked about like simulation, like VR kind of taking a new form. I think we're taking a switch from that and Assassin's Creed. I got my interest into history or anything just by playing those games. I decided to go look up the information for myself, but there's a new show on Netflix and it's not, it's like the original American series. So it's George Washington, it's John Adams, but it's a cartoon like Rick and Morty style. And it's the same humor (laughs) as Rick and Morty. I'm like, it might not be literal. Like John Adams is drinking beer and he's shooting off fireworks out of a giant cannon and he's blowing up the sky. He's like, yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. He keeps saying that. It's not real, obviously, like real history, but it has bits and pieces that's going to cause a kid to be like, is this what it is about? And then when they're reading it, they can remember that as they read it and actually soak in information easier. So it's like a it's a weird like sleight of hand, like curve that you're seeing with like just information being soaked in. And I find it fascinating. Yeah, that was that was kind of the approach when I started the YouTube channel that that we were talking about. Um, and like the whole idea was, it was called uncreated because it came from a place of uh, being in a museum where they get this exciting stuff in big crates normally. Um, but that didn't really land with a lot of people. <laughs> Understandably, I, <laughs> I get it. Um, but the whole idea was uncreate an adventure in your community, in your neighborhood, or go out to a museum and create an adventure. Um, to add to that supplemental, you know, whatever it is that you're learning in school, um, supplement that with something that you're creating or seeing in a different, um, in a different way, you know. Um, so, and then, you know, the the type of humor that, that we wrote into a lot of that stuff was um, sometimes we questioned whether kids would, would get it or want to watch it. Um, but it was always different. Like, taking a straight on approach, like we did a video about prohibition. Not a lot of kids know what that is, but we went to an event and got immersed into it and then took our little slant and like, eh, and here's some weirdo jokes that we made. <laughs> um, like doing a, a dance from the twenties. Um, you know, we taped the puppet's feet to my feet and here I am dancing with the puppet. And, <laughs> but kids are learning about traditional dances. I mean, that's the hope anyway. I think when Um, you create content, it's strange because what you intend to create it for never is the audience that you suspected to get. When I started this show, obviously it was just conversation. Whoever wanted to listen is available to, but I I expected somebody like younger to watch it or something like that. Um, Like my age, not mm -hmm. like my audience now, when I check it, it's people from 35 to 50 that listen to the show is the primary audience. And I'm like, there are adult people that are just interested in, you know, different conversations with different like scientists, researchers, or just average people from another place that they've never explored before. It's more, I think they enjoy the conversational style. And I'm like that. I didn't expect that audience. It's like um, for Joe Rogan, he his large part of his audience is men. And that seems like stereotypical for that, but that wasn't his intent to get every single like 70% is all men. It was supposed to be something completely different. Jordan Peterson's book about uh, the 10 steps or something like that. His large audience is women that buys the book, like 90 something percent buys the book that's women. And he goes, I didn't intend that to happen, but it's kind of like the title is fit for a man. And but women buy it because they want to know more about men, how they think, how they go. It's like an unintended cause or an effect. And I find that interesting because that just means you got to adapt it to a new audience. Even if you're using a puppet in the beginning to teach, you know, younger kids, help them soak up information. Also like sticking to the PC, the no cursing, the none of that. 
it's got to adapt to a new form. We're not really cookie cutter as we used to be back in like the twenties and fifties when someone would say, gosh, darn it. And then they would like, after they bump their knee, no, most of the time it's a curse word that comes out and it just adapts because the kids are, their shows are playing that now too. Back in the day in movies, yeah. you could never have anybody do nudity scenes unless it was a rated R movie. PG-13, they can drop two F words and that's, that's the max that they get. Because they know kids are already hearing it. You kind of have to adapt it to a new form. The no cursing thing, the action thing. Kids want to see that type of stuff because they're used to seeing it everywhere else. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then through the whole process of making that channel, my wife kind of kept reminding me, this doesn't have to be a kid's show, you know. Like, ease off of that whenever you feel like you have to be a certain way because you want it to be a kid's show. There's no reason it has to be. So that helped a lot. And that's helping a lot with developing this new idea that's more like um, sketch comedy. Oh, you got to pitch it to me right, dude. Hold on. Don't just toss it out. Pitch it to me right. What is the show? Okay. So I have like no branding, but I have (laughs) sketches written um, because I love sketch comedy, like Kroll Show, uh, Key and Peele, um, and Living Color going way back. SNL, of course. Um, I love sketch comedy. So that's that's the new idea. We're um, thinking of going with Science Town with Mr. Brown, where like we would still do some puppet stuff um, and do these sketches that teach about science or history or whatever. But you don't have to be a kid to learn from it or enjoy it. So so that's that's the focus now. It doesn't have to be for kids. It's just what it is. Did you happen to see Bo Burnham's special on Netflix called Inside? I did, yes. Did you see yes. where he had the, the sock puppet and it was called How the World Works? That, that where yes. the puppet starts talking and he goes, I don't think I can say anything that you haven't said already. And he goes, well, why don't you give it a shot? I'm sure you do. And then he starts going, it's, you're trying to remember that it's still him to speaking with his hand. But then you think the puppet has a mind of its own but it's really him saying it and he doesn't have a channel of where to say it with because he's on like this daytime kids show thing so he's got to be pc for the kids and the puppet is like the his real thoughts his real feelings the other side that comes out i'm like it hits on so many different levels you can do it like that but i like that form of education because then they i learned martin luther king got shot by the government i thought he just got shot it was the government right yeah, yeah, I think really just being open to whoever, like you were saying, whoever might enjoy it is uh, is the, the approach I like to try and channel, just like make it accessible to people. And then it has my little weird twist and my brand of, you know, whatever I want to put into it. Like, like I love Tom Waits' music. Listen to Tom Waits a lot. That gravelly voice, just <laughs> I don't know why, but but it pulls me in. So I did a bit that was like an homage to Tom Waits in a video, which is obviously not going to be for an eight-year-old. So yeah. um, no eight-year-olds are going to know who that is or, or know the sound or what I'm doing, but it looks funny. And so they might just laugh at it and be like, oh yeah, this is a cool part of this video. Have and then you, older people will get it. So have you ever thought about taking any of the stuff that you try and teach, find the actual videos, like, you know, when teachers would play a video or documentary or something about the topic that they're learning? Have you ever thought about making a reaction video? So you're in the corner of the screen while it's playing and then talking about it, but making it in a better form with your jokes, with your certain (laughs) things to make kids be able to understand it easier. I mean, half of these nature documentaries, Mm. if you're not laughing at the dude that's saying in the pile of wubble, like he's doing that. If you're not laughing at that, you're they want someone that's going to be speaking to them like, all right, so what this guy is saying right here is that this is a giant glacier. So there was a glacial period and then you just go off about it or you can talk about Anne Frank. You can talk about something, but you can do it in a better way that's going to actually soak up to a kid, especially if they're your students, for instance. If you're targeting them or if you're just targeting a broad audience of people, they just want to see something that's not the same boring, bland out. I mean, even when I watch a documentary about cults, it's about cults. You should be interested in cults. That's the craziest thing is people being convinced to do things because whatever would happen in their life. But even when you're watching the first like 10 minutes, you're like, oh, my God, I watched the Bigfoot documentary they had on Netflix. What are we the first hour is only entertaining because they introduce like 
Well, it happened at 3 a.m. I saw Bigfoot and it was on a cannabis farm that I was illegally on. And you're like, what? What are you what are you talking about? And then the first hour is just a guy showing you these giant nugs of weed that he has. And I'm like, this is like entertaining. But it the, to, for me to get to this moment of the documentary, I had to sit through 20 minutes of explaining everything. And it, I need someone there that's keeping my attention because I'm gone like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think that having like a shorter form approach, having like five minutes or less to do a sketch to teach a thing and then move on to the next thing, move on to the next thing. Um, that's, that's where my mind is at right now. But I like, I like that whole like mystery science theater kind of approach to, <laughs> to doing a, a, watching like a, a serious nature video and then commenting on it, correcting it, cracking some jokes. I like yeah, that like idea. When Snoop Dogg does Animal Planet when he's voicing it in the background, he's like, oh my, he's, he's like, that's one of those cobras. And he just starts, it's just Snoop Dogg, but you know, it's Snoop. So it's funny. I mean, you got the green screen, you got the lights and everything like that. You could easily do like a weatherman style thing where you're just standing in a documentary or something and explaining it. Like if you were a weatherman point, like here's where the tornado comes in, but you could be doing it with like anything through history or any single subjects that you find super fascinating or super interesting and analyze it that way mm -hmm. and chop it up into a video, put it on YouTube about 10, 15 minutes long. People like people for me, I like the longer ones, not like necessarily necessarily an hour long unless it's like a full-on documentary that someone's explaining but yeah. it also you, you can't be deadpan bro i've seen too many youtube videos right. where the guy's like and then there was this that happened i'm like what are we watching i feel like he's just sucked my soul out through the youtube video right yeah that's another thing i've had to tap into with teaching in the last three years um you know getting in front of that classroom you've got to hold their attention and these are all different people. Like, not all children are the same, obviously. They're different people with different, you know, interests. And you've got to be able to hold that, that energy captive for them <laughs> so they can listen to what you're saying. Uh, and you can't just be up there like Ben Stein in <laughs> Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know. Yeah. Bueller, Bueller. Like, I can't imagine teaching like that. So you, you kind of got to have a knack as a performer to really engage kids in their education. It's also, I think we talked about the first time was that how hard it is to be a teacher. The credit I give teachers is the aspect of making sure that you can teach new kids every single year, knowing that all these information that you just put into their minds is now going on to a different person and you have to restart the whole process of everything. I guess it gets mm -hmm. easy because then it becomes routine, but it's just the fact of reiterating, reiterating, reiterating. You have to make it more like, I remember I had a, I think one of the very few teachers I've had, probably four, my total of my whole entire just educational experience have really kind of taken the time of day for me. And one was a junior um, U.S. history teacher, Mr. McGackie called me R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. Those are my initials. He called me that, but he would yeah. make it fun. And I'm like, how do you do this like every day? And how do you do this every year with the same batch of kids? And he goes, that's what you got to do. You got to keep changing it up. Some days I have my bad days, but I come in, I make sure I can still get the stuff taught, but I can make it fun and interesting where I change it up. So I don't feel like I'm stuck in a rut. And I'm like, that's yeah. so true. People don't even think about that. They just think, oh, you get paid to be a teacher and do this. I'm like, well, that's how you end up with teachers that just want to sit and then click a bunch of stuff and just have you watch a screen all day because it, it, I get it. It gets difficult at times. It's, it's got to change it up. There are mm -hmm. some episodes if I'm doing the same, that's why I try and change it up on my show. If I have a cult person on, I need to talk to an anti-cult person. And I need to talk to a, a religious person. And I need, I need to keep changing up and dip to all sides of the pool. So I'm not just feeling like I'm only sticking to a show that talks about 1980 Furbies. And I'm like, I'm not doing that at all. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And the beauty with teaching to me, I mean, I'm, I'm still fresh and new at it. But what helps uh, keep me going into the year with a good vibe is that we might be teaching the same content that I worked with last year, but I have all these different kids, and they're going to pick up on different aspects of it. They'll have different opinions about it, different things to share about it, different questions they want to explore. And so that is going to keep the teachers on their toes as long as they're up for it you know if they're not stuck in their own rut then they'll vibe off of the kids interests and 
and that'll help keep them fresh and maybe give them something to pull into the next year's lessons. I think um, the biggest probably struggle too is also trying to get the kids out of their own world that they're soaked up into to be able to focus on the content. I mean, that's still a problem with me today, but when Mm -hmm. I was a kid, when I was in middle school, high school, or even elementary school, all I was worried about was when I got home, what I was going to be doing, who I was going to be hanging out with, what I was going to be watching on. Lizard Lick Towing was the biggest thing fucking back then. I was all over Lizard Lick Towing. That was a great show. You know, thing of friendly, friendly's ice cream and just sit down and watch Lizard Lick Towing. But that's all that was on my mind is what was I going to do when I get home? What was I going to be going to next? Not what was happening in the moment. And then when you get out of school, you truly start to appreciate all the things that you were really getting a free education for. I think it's just hard because you feel forced for eight hours to sit there and you know deal with everything like that yeah now so many kids like I've worked in sixth grade last year and I'll be there again this coming year and these kids most of them have a phone and they have social media accounts and TikTok is huge with with the age group so like they're constantly doing the dances from TikTok and like making their own videos or making videos where they're like ranting about what happens at school, which is where it gets a little weird for the adults. Like when we have kids coming up and saying, so-and-so made this video on TikTok about something at school, we're like, whoa, 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 hey now, isn't social media supposed to be fun? Like, what are you guys doing with it? Yeah, that, um, And if they get that... distracted from, from school. That was the one thing I know when, before we did this podcast, I was thinking, I was like, I remember he's a teacher. I got to make sure I'm not too sporadic in my actions here because that does reflect on, you know, a kid could dig that up. I don't want a kid getting you in trouble or anything like that. That'd be terrible. <laughs> on my podcast, some person gets in trouble. I don't want that to happen ever. If anything, it's something I say, I get myself canceled. Um, but it's, I think it's important. What's weird is like, we talk about the, the shift, the importance of this is like the shift with, um, video games and then all taking a new form it being like that, Mm -hmm. uh, where this new show I was explaining to you kind of is like getting kids interested in looking it up. TikTok, all of our information and news is now coming from TikTok and coming from gifts and memes. I mean, everything, everything right now is memes of freaking Vin Diesel talking about the family. Um, but it's, that's the new form of like, we talk about what it's going to be in the future conversations, not through individual handshakes and talking to someone and going on a date that, that way by meeting someone, it's now either online, every conversation is kind of moved to text, or now it's moved to a zoom platform, or it's moved to some type of virtual thing. This is going to become the normal. And then 10, 20 years from now, it's going to be a new form. Like now it's turning into GIFs, memes, and TikToks are now becoming an educational source. I mean, news ended up becoming so boring. It just went down to the Colbert Report or the Jimmy Stewart Show or whatever it was called. It was a comedy form of teaching you the topics that are going on in the world. They crack a joke on it. You soak in the information. Now that's turning into memes, GIFs, and TikToks where you'll click on a TikTok, might see a funny person dance, or or you might see some dude rattling off a bunch of political stuff about the CC or the CCP or some type of government out there. Right, right. So that's an aspect of TikTok I didn't pick up on right away. But again, my wife coming through with the information and showing me like all these science people on TikTok, you know, getting as much information into a minute as they can. And so that's definitely something that I want to try to uh, work on for the the next phase of my like YouTube outreach bug that I have, (laughs) where I have to just get these, these ideas out. Um, I think some of them would be really good for TikTok, and hopefully help help give more positive stuff out there and maybe give me a more positive vibe about it. (laughs) I don't know. It's definitely a new form not only of entertainment, but a new form of a creative outlet for a lot of people. I mean, back when podcasting Mm -hmm. was super big, um, like about a year ago when we talked, it was huge, at least a lot bigger than it was now. Now it's kind of like dwindling off people's shows are kind of stopping in a way. And then people are moving on to other things. It seems like the trend is kind of flipped off of it onto something else. And I look at it like it just depends on what, like we talk about the sports thing, for instance, imagine being so good at a sport, knowing that there's going to be an injury. Imagine you're good at doing something creative by just by talking or having fun or just trying to get your own thoughts out there as well, too. 
We don't move on because the trend changes. You think the trend always stays on baseball or golf? The people that are in golf aren't doing it for the fame. You could walk right by them in a store, not even know their name unless it's Tiger Woods because of the stuff that happened with him. But a regular right. golfer doesn't care about that. They love it for the thing of the game of it. There's more commitment to it when you actually care about what you're doing, when you're crafting out a bit, or if you're teaching, you don't get into mm -hmm. it for the money. You do it because you care about the thing that you're doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't like stay up until three in the morning <laughs> trying to craft that script or whatever, like, uh, like I've done before. Um, so yeah, so another big change along with like the shift in the YouTube stuff, I took the time to start doing a master's degree and doing it completely remotely online. So I'm a remote student now, even though I hated being a remote teacher. Um, and that's pretty nice. How, um, um, what, uh, what are you going for though on your master's degree? A master's of elementary education. So I'll finish that and become a certified teacher once I'm done. That's a, now, how long do you have to do that for before you, be, you get your certificate and everything? So that's where being online is really helpful. Um, if you're a kind of person who just dives into stuff and hammers it out, you can get it done pretty quickly in like a year. Um, I'm not that person like, I've got a, a big stove and a lot of pots and pans on it, I guess is the way to put it. Um, and adding this to the, to the mix uh, was a really good thing. It's valuable and helps me do my job better as a paraeducator, learning to be a teacher. And it helps me learn to write for educating better. So it's gonna help me make better content, I think, in the long run. Um, I, I thought about going back to get like another degree because I went for chemical dependency, got the certificate for that. And then I ended up switching over to psychology, but I just got my associates. I wasn't trying to go to because every school that would teach either psychology or something in my area it was like a good hour and a half away. It was like the nearest mm -hmm. university to be able to do so. And I was like, I cut my, uh, I guess, whatever the associate's degree in half by just taking six or seven classes online and then going to school for two of them, the ones that you couldn't do online. And I thought about mm -hmm. going back to see like, hey, if I'm killing time and stuff too, but there's, I, there's, it's so hard to get a job when it comes to even if you're trying to go for that specific thing that you're going for. I talked to so many academics that they have their master's degree and they're still looking for a place. I've talked to astrophysicists mm -hmm. that's still looking for new jobs and stuff like that. It's just the trend is so quick and changing. Nothing's solidified with a degree anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the case. And now in teaching, they're saying if you go into teaching and you don't, work towards or already have a master's degree then you got to get on it because it's going to help boost your pay and boost you know your credibility and your abilities just by going through the coursework and learning more about the craft you're going to get better and you're going to get better compensated and have a better life in the long run so any teachers who aren't master's degree holders they should do that that's it's just, it's so strange to me because I fear for what it's going to be like in 10 years. Like we say it's different now. Um, even when I was thinking, I was like, man, it's so much better when I was a kid. Like you didn't have to worry about all these things that you have to worry about now. And then it's like, yeah. I wonder what my grandparents think. I wonder what my great grandparents thought when they were going through all this and they get to see the world now and how much it's changed. I'm like, is it, they didn't complain about it really. So I was like, is it just cause the biggest change has happened in the past 10 years has been like the most that's happened. At least I would say revolutionary wise, besides like wars and things of that sort that happened that kind of changed the tides of everything. But when it came to technology, that thing is rapidly grown. I mean, 10 years ago, we were still using like built-in computers to your wall that like startup and all that, the AOL with the now right. it's like you have a cell phone that's in your pocket that's on you 24 seven. You have to worry about people selling your data now, selling your tracking. And I'm like, is it just advancing so much now? Cause we went to the moon once and then now we're at Mars. And I'm like, now they're talking about building a civilization or building hotels. And I'm like, this seems mm -hmm. like this past couple of years has just kicked up like to amperage 100 when we were on crank 10. 
Yeah, and you're seeing it worldwide where like China's space program is now rivaling NASA in ways. They're putting probes on Mars. They're talking about building a colony on the moon to eventually try to live there or have researchers live there anyway. And um, so you're seeing it around the world. And like, I've heard about researchers in, I, I think, Japan trying to make digital paper so that we don't have to cut down trees for paper. We've got digital paper that's like a, an iPad, but flexible, like a sheet of paper. I know recently that's... they just started putting plastic bottles using all the um, leftover recyclables and starting to turn them into Legos. Legos started doing that to make oh. like new types of, but then I'm like, man, we're gonna have a lot of Legos everywhere. How many Lego bins <laughs> do you find at a thrift store? You know what I mean? Like there's gotta right. be a way to try and find another use for it, obviously down the line, but. It seems like we're taking major innovations, but every innovation or change happens to not do with the things that we're focusing on here now. They seem to be like, I'm going to do this because it's inevitably going to come to this point. I'm like, I don't want it to get to that point. Let's focus on the things stopping it from getting to that point. I mean, colonizing on the moon, people, in my opinion, I don't want to leave Earth ever. I'd rather die here because I've been born here. I don't want to have to worry about a helmet thing. Uh, but if you colonize on the moon, people are like, why are Bezos and all these people trying to go up there? I'm like, imagine you're thinking of it like living on a whole new planet. They're thinking of it. I'm going to be the first person that comes to this planet. Now I'm the toll booth. Whoever wants to come live up here once I've built my stuff has to go through me. That's how it goes into. Right. And I'm like, it's so yep. mind bending and changing. All these kids are going to be growing up in something like this. I mean, I'm only 23, so I'm technically kind of growing up in it, too. But it looks like, oh my God, can we go back like in technology a little bit? Like I'll be fine by using messenger pigeon for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's funny. But mentioning throwbacks, a lot of kids during the school year were talking to me about vines because they're so into TikTok and they're like, oh man, that TikTok's so 2014. That's like a vine. Like, where did you hear about a vine? Like, did you google that how did you go into the archives to learn about this it's because jake paul fought floyd mayweather a youtuber fought a freaking professional boxer an undefeated oh, professional wow. boxer you don't know about this no i did not hear that oh my god it was like the biggest news so they had jake paul remember the old vine guy jake paul he became a yeah or no it wasn't jake paul it was i think it was logan paul logan is his older brother the really tall blonde one okay um, okay. He's the one that fought Floyd Mayweather and it became this huge giant event. I mean, he's worth over like, I think they say $4 million or something like that net worth. Um, okay. He has I mean, insane. Amount, he's only 26. He's doing insane things. I know everyone doesn't really like him because he's like a YouTuber that's doing all this crazy stuff, but he yeah. fought a professional boxer Floyd money Mayweather. So you're like, that wow. dude was from vine. When I was in middle school, I would see him do a vine of like, when the freaking what is it the harlem shake was a thing like <laughs> right so it's like it's just strange to see how like fast things go uh, like forward backward i think like even now with social media instagram's kind of dying down um mostly because instagram has set up a lot of roadblocks now if you're going to create content they kind of want to capitalize on the product or the content from it and then Snapchat mm -hmm. used to be huge back in the day. It's not really as big anymore, but Facebook is coming around again. I see so many people now on Facebook and I'm like, is it, is Facebook coming back to like the 2005 era where everyone's like, here's a photo of my family. Here's a photo of me. Here's my photo <laughs> of my family with sunglasses on and they keep editing and they keep posting the same photo, but it's like yeah. making a shift around. And I'm like, I'm wondering what's going to be coming back. Cause there are some things that we left in the past that necessarily shouldn't have been left in the past. Bakugan is probably the best example. They brought that back and I was calling that a year ago. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering this the other day at a flea market, I saw a view master. You remember those old like ching and you got the wheel with the pictures. <laughs> I wondered like, are those going to see a comeback or is, is Viewmaster going to like reboot itself? Or I would love to see more Viewmasters around. I think 
technology has made everything really, really cool, but I also think it's made things go too fast. And when I say that mm -hmm. is I think people are also still wanting to hold on to some stuff that's still going around. And I'm not talking about anything yeah. political. I'm just talking about like when you have like a, a photo on a wall or collage that your family makes with prints, people want the, the printed photo. They want to put a photo in an album. Now it's like you can get a digital mm -hmm. album that'll swipe multiple different photos. And it's like, I still just like it to be the one photo to stare at, not just have this technology thing that if i drop it and it breaks my photo has gone it's everything i have to re-download it onto something else it's more of a task yeah yeah i feel like deeper contemplation is kind of getting lost in culture uh, in a lot of ways where things like that where you would have a photo on the wall that reminds you of something or makes you think of of someone or something and you just sit and have a quiet moment and look at your wall and <laughs> scan the photos and take a trip back and remember. And I, I feel like with all this technology, people don't take the time to do that sort of stuff anymore. Um, is it a contemplationist or contemplationism or something like that? It's like a class of people that just sit and kind of contemplate a question or con it's a, it's, I saw it on, um, I wish I could remember the name of it. Cause it was talking about different types of like thought processes and it was like, it's like a contemplationist or something. And it was a picture of the thinker. And it's just mm -hmm. someone that always brings up a, a, a perspective that's not there. So if someone wants to build something and they just go, well, what about if it affects this? And it's like that second voice. And it's like a group mm -hmm. of people. And apparently it's like, it's like being like a, it's like a it's like a party like a democrat or a republican but it's a, con a contemplationist and it's a different type okay. of school of thought and basically like everyone's like nobody likes that person because they're always butting in and they're always bringing an opinion they never want to do anything i'm like or are they just thinking about a critical answer because how many people do something without thinking about it right yeah i think allowing things to kind of stew like ideas to sit and kind of smolder for a while is a valuable way to spend time on your ideas you know you gotta you gotta second guess yourself a little bit <laughs> like Just at 3 a.m sure. when you're making a comedy bit it might sound really good but you know not to publish it until the next day when you can relook <laughs> over it i've had that happen multiple yes. times <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um and just contemplating and reflecting on your life and the lives of or experiences of your family and friends and really soak in the value that those people provide to you and that your past provides to you as you go into your future. I yeah. wonder if with the technology shift, if kids are being less apt, I would say, to worry about what other people think of them, or is it getting worse? Because I remember when I was a kid and social media was becoming super popular, started becoming like this huge thing that everyone's talking about. You got to get on Facebook. You got to get on this. And it's like, that was the biggest fear was like, don't post something stupid. Don't do something crazy. Don't put anything that's going to make me look bad or people around me look bad that I'm friends with. Don't get made fun of at this. I wonder if it's like that now, or now it seems like if you push the boundary, if you take the shot, if you act reckless, if you do whatever, not caring what anybody else thinks, are you going to end up being more more successful because how many times have your own thoughts about what others someone else is going to think of you held you back from doing something yeah yeah from what i've seen with kids in like the fifth and sixth grade level they're already kind of hyped up about what everyone thinks about them and their universe is a little egocentric not not really by any fault of their own it's just how their brains work um so they are they're already concerned like before social media, when I was their age, I was like, I remember feeling those things like, oh man, if I wear this, it's, I'm gonna hear about it the next day or whatever. Um, but I was always kind of blown out of proportion in my own mind, which I try to share with these kids now. Like, even though you're online, you might post a stupid video, you can delete it. And you can also post one that's better, you know? Just do something better. If you did something you didn't like, move on, learn, be better. There's always a chance to move on and be better. I think, especially when you say the internet's forever, 
probably if you delete it, it gets stored somewhere. But I think people yeah, care yeah. too much, especially that moment. You're really contemplating and trying to decipher who you are as, a, as who you are going to be. And then yeah. I think you do that throughout your whole entire life. I don't think you ever figure out who you're going to be. I think you're constantly on a journey of trying to unravel that mystery until the very end. But when you mm -hmm. get older, it's less impactful into your mind as it is when you're a kid and you're worried about popularity. You're worried about fighting. You're worried about all right. these types of things that impact you because you're around all these people 24 seven, usually when you're at school or when you, you know, for the next 15 or so years, you're in school. When you yeah. become an adult, and you get out of school and you're like, I miss it so much. It's graduation goggles. You don't necessarily miss it. You just miss the fact that you used to see these people every day. And now you rarely see them. I mean, when you get older, you start to realize like, even I'm, I'm in my twenties, but there's probably 15 from 15 to 30 kids that were in my graduating class that are dead. So it's like, you really kind of examine just the aspect of like, what were, what was I so worried about with this person? What was I so worried about with this? And it hits this level where you start to understand, like, if someone throws a, a jab at you on social media, if someone does any of this stuff, why do you care? You don't care mm -hmm. because nobody can. The biggest enemy is the one inside of your own head. And I think kids are going to end up. You learn that when Absolutely. you become an adult, because I think my biggest issue with like parents, for instance, is I don't think you should ever tell your kid they can be president or they can be astronaut. And when I say that is just say they can be whatever they want to be. Because when you say you can be a president, you can be an astronaut, and they turn 30 years old and they're working for an electrical company, they're not exactly the happiest with how their life turned out when they get so built up with specific jobs. Just say you can be anything because yeah. it leaves a free range of motion for them to decipher out and find what they want to be. Yeah, yeah. And I would tag onto that, that, that parents would serve their kids and their community well by like trying to lay the groundwork for that it's great to encourage them and say, you know, you can be whatever you want as long as you work hard, but to really help them find the things to build that up from a young age. Like, look, you can go volunteer at this place when you're this old and you can learn how to do the work of that job. So then they have some experience before they're out of high school and they have a better idea of what they actually wanna do with themselves because some kids may not wanna go to college. You know, they may be told you could be anything you want and they think, well, I want to be, I mean, I grew up in a family of farmers, maybe I want to be a farmer. And because of their family knowledge, they may not need much college for that. And that would be good to know before you go out and get a four year degree, you know, yeah, so I helping provide that pathway so they know the steps to, to properly take toward that goal would be the next level of parenting. Yeah, the key to survive is kind of a tricky one. The key to what you would call successful. I consider successful mm -hmm. if you wake up out of bed and you don't hate what you're doing. You don't hate what life that you're in. If you can look in the mirror and smile, if you can look in the mirror and do those types of things, I don't think you need Jake Paul money. I don't think you need those types of things. But hey, there right. are some days where I'm like, I wish I had Jake Paul money. But <laughs> at the same time, I mean, if I can get up and just feel like I don't have any weight on me, that should be the biggest success to strive to. And I think just mm -hmm. putting that in some kid's head saying you can do anything. But the main thing is to make sure that you never feel like you have a weight on your chest, because that is probably the thing that sinks a lot of ships. It's the fact that people nowadays have a weight on their chest. They have a weight on their mind. They have a weight on them all day long, 24 seven, and it never goes away unless they're sleeping. And even then when they wake up, they still got it there. It doesn't go away. It just, you don't feel it when you sleep. And right. that's not a, that's just a, that's just a plagued map to lay in bed all day long and never want to explore what the world has to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And things like that are kind of grabbing kids. Like we were talking about with the, the TikToks and all the social media excitement that they that they drum up that's kind of a distraction to them we've got to like hammer home to them that there's no shame in being wrong you know being wrong or doing something that you feel like is foolish is an opportunity to learn and you know people may not forget about it the internet may never forget but that doesn't stop you from moving on you know and you can use that as a lesson and and try not to let it keep you in bed all day. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's just, 
that's a tough one. I hope hopefully that'd be a better roadmap or something for kids to be able to figure out rather than just people saying it like in a motivational type way. But it's a right. real thing that's going on too, is kids trying to find out who they are. And I think everyone's still on that journey, but if we find a oh, process yeah. or a better method where people can worry less in just the slightest of ways. And it seems like social media is like the main one for a lot of people. Yeah. You can make that easier then I think you got a good start on something. Right. Yeah. We'll see how it all plays out. Well, Brad, you giving me enough of your time, man. Is there any uh, place people can find you? Have you started the comedy sketches yet? Is there a channel for it? There is not. I have like nothing official. I just have, have sketches written in my notebook. <laughs> okay. That's, that's a good process. So, though. Um, so yeah, for now, um, there's the, the old uncreated on YouTube is, is always going to be there. And, um, the blog on the Wix website, it's always going to be there. And I'm looking to post a story that I had written last year about the whole uncreated journey. So there will be something newish popping up over there. You should, um, are you going to switch the channel over the uncreated channel over to a new channel when you get the comedy bits? I think I'll just start totally fresh, totally new thing. Yeah. Like it. Okay. Keep the videos up for everyone else that wants to watch them. See how pop watch it. They probably might, they might be popular in a year from now. That's the funny thing about like the whole trend thing <laughs> is next thing you know, it becomes super popular out of randomness. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool. But I'll make sure I link everything in the description, Brad. You're giving me enough of your time. Is there anything you want to end on? Oh, man. <laughs> Last words. I'm putting it to you. Last words. I'm real hung up on this lately, like before today and everything. But mistakes are learning opportunities. I just got to say it again. Like I'm, I'm re-watching the Hobbit movies and seeing <laughs> all the mistakes that they're making. And it all leads towards something bigger in the end. You just you know, keep your focus and do your best. Mistakes will come. You will learn. You will do better. I'm not a fan of the, the like the, the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings, but in Lord of the Rings, or I don't know if it's Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, Gandalf wipes his pipe with his beard. <laughs> I didn't even notice it. I was like, oh my God, I totally glossed uh, over that. But he takes his little crusty beard and wipes off his pipe with it and then smokes out of it. I'm like, that's so, huh. that's so cringe. Yes. Yeah. I hope he's not passing that pipe around. <laughs> be a little weird to be in that circle. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to this episode out of the blank podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode.